In this video, we are going to be talking about the Igmar Bergman film that he both wrote and directed from 1955, Smiles of a Summer Night. My guest today is Nathan Jones. He's one of my Bergman partner in crimes, <laughs> I like to call him. Uh, we've had some wonderful talks uh, about Bergman and other films over the uh, in the last year or so. He has a, a YouTube channel himself, which is uh, dedicated to physical media and different film reviews. Nathan, welcome back. I'm glad that you could be here again. Well, thanks, Robert. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful to be back talking about Bergman because he's definitely um, one of those filmmakers that just is he's like the gift that keeps on giving um, or maybe taking away because uh, sometimes oh, well in this case it's giving because yeah. it's definitely a lot more lighthearted. but obviously uh, you know through his filmography you, you know you get all this you get the whole spectrum of uh, human emotion so um, yeah. which is just fun so yeah I'm, I'm glad to be back this was uh, my first viewing of of this film I hadn't seen it before so I'm curious um how many have you seen it uh you know more than once and has and if so has your experience uh changed over seeing it on repeat viewings have your feelings changed about it at all yeah i've seen this movie about three times now uh, the the last time you know being recently for this um but uh this was actually the first film that i watched in the box set because it's curated this way um right. for the ingmar bergman so you know unboxing uh well in Bar ingmar bergman cinema for people um who know about this criterion release yeah. um it's the first film that is curated there from uh, and that was kind of how i started with this journey i had seen seven seal and wild strawberries before even persona um but those are the movies i didn't uh follow in order with that but uh once i started that um you know i guess over two years ago now um, i had watched it again uh maybe last year and then uh again this time and i i would say on repeat viewing i've only grown a more fondness towards the film because i mean it's there's a lot going on i mean it's easy to follow for sure um but there's definitely uh, a lot of relationships uh to follow and there's a lot of really great dialogue to, to keep up with. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can kind of catch, uh, you know, the more, more you see it, the more things you catch. And it's like, there's some subtle innuendos and, and things like that, the, the subtleties um, make it a really uh, fantastic re revisit and a rewatch. I, I, I really, I, I agree with that because there's, there's so much going on and I haven't seen him tell a story with this kind of tone. Like, I know this is not one, of, I know he did, he did a few comedies, and I suppose I'm, I probably know his work more from seven, you know, post seven seal. Uh, but this is still like just before that. And I know it was a real breakthrough for him as well, just uh, in terms of box office, not just in Sweden, but from all over the world. Um, do you, I'm curious, is there any, is there any indication as to why it's the first film curated on, on that box set? I wonder why that was chosen as the first one to go with. Uh, I think it's a really good idea of maybe getting uh, the fact that he is uh, Bergman at the center of a lot of Bergman's things are relationships and, right. um, and how those relationships play out. Not always romantic necessarily, but um, with this one, I, I think is a really good start um, from that angle, but also at the same time, this is like one of his lightest films. Um, but it's also like one of those uh, sharp films too. There was a little bit of, um, I feel like a critique there's like, like, the, like there's the class like a, divisions like the bourgeois like yeah the yeah the upstairs downstairs upstairs downstairs <laughs> kind of you know downton abbey yeah. you think that uh kind of stuff um but yeah and there's like a little bit of a sharp like witticism towards like class and then also it's like comedic um so you know i think i think it's a good starting off point uh for people who maybe aren't so like they're not going to go straight for the seven seal or persona yeah uh, or you know the heavier marriage, like the yeah. heavier stuff you're not going to go straight for those you want to ease into a festival like this so if you know if the um i feel like if the curation's like this you want to ease into it and i feel like this is a, a, a really great start uh to that and also like kind of like the creme de la creme of his early works if you will like before mm -hmm. seventh seal right it's it's like the the pinnacle of like 
you know, I feel like um, of the, of these early works uh, for him, and especially in um, with uh, like Gunnar uh, Gunnar Fisher, like his cinematographer right. um, at that time. I think this is definitely one of the prettiest films too uh, to look at as well. We'll get to that, I'm sure, but. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, I think that's a good point because it, it certainly has uh, beneath the light touch uh, of the film in the, in the comedy and even the fact that even the score is uh, very light and humorous, he, he still has a real uh, darkness to the relationships and uh, to the characters. So, which of course, you know, you'd certainly see in the 60s and 70s that he, he really went directly for um, the more complex natures of relationships and the darker sides. Um, he goes right for the jugular. So I think this is a good introduction to sort of ease you into those themes and those feelings and those kind of relationships. But, you know, in a, in a comedic way. I mean, to me, this is it's very Shakespearean in that, in the sense, uh, in Shakespeare's comedies, like the oh, yeah. comedy of airs and um, Midnight the Summer, relationships. Midnight Summer's Dream, yeah. Yeah, Midnight Summer's Dream. And, and even if you look at some of the uh, uh, plots that particularly the women are up to uh, later on in this film before that big party, when they're going to get everybody together and you don't know what exactly they're up to, but they have this plot to basically, you know, make sure that, um, you know, one of them can get their husband back and then the other one can get, get the man who she loves uh, out of his marriage in, to, to be with her. And, you know, if you look at, and, and the way they do it is, there, it, it is funny. And if you look at even like Shakespeare's Othello, like Iago is constantly plotting. And a lot of his plots in order to bring down um, uh, Othello are, are hilarious and <laughs> and but yet we don't think of, of that play that way because it is very dark but it, it has a certain uh, dark sense of humor to it so mm -hmm. uh, one wonders if Shakespeare was an inspiration here for for Bergman but uh, aside from that even though there's a lot of characters um, you know it's it's a little more plot heavy than perhaps some of his other films what do you think it's it's truly about from your what do you take away from it from your perspective um I, I think it's interesting because it's like a combination of like that cynical thing that we're talking about like obviously humans and, and relationships can can be really I, I guess um I think um the the good, really great speech by Frid who's one of the servants in this um to Petra uh, the, the, the two servant characters necessarily in particular where it's more of like breaking the fourth wall uh for the audience and yeah. like when it's that they scene feel like where narrators they're, to an extent right yeah they're on the outside um and they're sitting under that tree in the movie and you know he starts talking about the you know the world of lovers and like how there's so uh, such a small a number of them and the rest of us are on the outside wanting it tasting it where you know where we think we have it all that stuff I think there's that cynical nature and then there's also that romantic sense that we get from like movies and also these like fairy tales or even something like, you know, Shakespeare's plays or maybe this is more like a French comedy as well. There's like mm -hmm. that, those, those elements there. Um, there's like a, an element of realism and also an element of cynicalism uh, towards relationships, but also at the same time, I, I love how the ending is a little bit more uh, towards the fairy tale side of things where it's a little bit more um, I, I mean, I guess the perfect thing to see is like, you know, that little uh, Cupid blowing the trumpet when like, the beds <laughs> right. come out. Like it's, yeah. it's almost like that moment, right? That triumphant moment is like, oh, you know, like here's your dreams come true, this kind of a thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it is, it is overly simplified, but I think that that's part of the charm. As you said, like the Cupid, like it's part, it, it sort of it has that fairy tale. Uh, aspect to it yeah that's a good point because I didn't necessarily think of it in terms of fairy tale and when things were sort of wrapped up and everybody more or less gets what they want um part of me was like oh come on really but then I I I sort of I could see why he was doing that because it, it it's meant to be tongue-in-cheek and it's and these people um at the same time they they experience a lot of growth in the story because uh, I, I think ultimately it's like people 
their quest for love and, and finding love and everybody is with the wrong person, right. uh, which I find so fascinating. And just, you know, looking at the cast, for example, um, I'm so bad with pronouncing a lot of these Swedish names. Uh, of course, Gunnar Bornstrand, who he used uh, in many of his films, Winter Light, um, among others, you know, he's married to this young woman and uh, played Anne, Anne Eagerman as a character played by Ulla uh, Jacobson. And it's so fascinating because he thinks he loves her. But it, it, of course, it's that scene where at night he is, you know, he wakes up in a in a, a bit of a dream and they're right. kissing and he says uh, Desiree, which is his ex uh, lover's name. And she's a, a famous actress played by Eva Dahlback. And she was, of course, in a, a number uh, of his films as well. And then, you know, this really dark relationship where hit with his son. Right. Who's, and Rick, who's yeah. yeah, who's clearly in. Um, it, well, it's not so clear until later that he's actually in love with like his stepmom, you know, who's, right. who's younger than him. <laughs> Same age as Henrik though. <laughs> ish same yeah yeah they're like yeah they're like around around uh, the same age and um you you can see how he was certainly uh, bergman was certainly making those suggestions strong like what for example she smacks him because he was flirting with petra who's who's the uh, uh housekeeper played by harriet anderson and you know, why would she do that other than because she's jealous? You know, I mean, why, why would she really care? So there's something going on there. And then, of course, the soldier character who was like one of the, he's like the buffoon of the piece to me. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to find the actor's name here. Uh, is it Jarl is Cool, who plays Count Carl Magnus Malcolm? Yes, that's him. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, it, it, it's just, I mean, for me, he was like the epitome of a macho man. I guess what people today would call uh, toxic masculinity, let's say, or, right. you know, because he's like, A, he's a soldier. Uh, not that that's, not that it's toxic to be a soldier, but he looks at a soldier because he's a quote unquote man who can shoot things. And he's constantly like shooting things, even in his house. Um, and, you know, he cheats openly on his wife and tells her about it as if he has the right to do it <laughs> and this is all of a disguise because he actually as we find out he actually does really love his wife it's just that his idea of his of a man is someone who has to constantly prove himself so it's almost as if him and gunnar wear these masks you know like that they uh struggle to take off because they have these ideas of what men are and that men are these kind of macho types who right. cheat on their, you know, cheat or, 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 or perhaps play Russian, in, Russian, play Russian. Yeah. Roulette. The, the Russian roulette scene. Yeah. And perhaps Gunnar, I wonder if he's with this woman, this young woman, just because it's like, he's, she's like a trophy wife, you know I mean? Right. He, he, they're not, they haven't even had sex or anything for two years. And I think he thinks he loves her because he goes to Desiree and, basically says to her tell me if this is hopeless you know and that's why she you know creates that party later but i i i really just thought that he was someone who was very surface and wanted the appearance of look at this woman i'm with look at this woman i'm with and he has those pictures of her he's taking and he, he's and and there's even that great moment where he looks at the pictures later he says her name out loud when he's alone but there, there's no coloring of feeling there's there's really nothing between them. And it's just so interesting what that does to the son, because he's this guy who's a who's becoming a priest. And at the same time, he's impotent. <laughs> and everyone mocks him about that, you know, and, and no one helps him. So I really think this element, I think he was really ahead of its time in that sense, Bergman, and saying he was he was sort of poking fun at a certain kind of men who um, destroy themselves because of these facades, you know? I don't know if that was something that registered with you, Nathan. Yeah, I would say so too. I mean, uh, for me, I think it's it's a combination of also a, a lot of the times with, with Bergman, a lot of his characters uh, come from his own reality. So right, um, right. I think 
and then Bergman's like notoriously egotistical and narcissistic, right? And so I feel like some of these insecurities that he has, yeah, uh, yeah. were put into these characters as well. And he, I mean, he, I'm sure he saw those things about himself. And oh yeah, uh, he was pretty people, honest with him about himself. Yeah, yeah. brutally. And, and I think, um, like, I, it makes me think too. Like, I know we're going back to thinking about uh, how it ends and it's a little bit more fantastical or, you know, more like a, how a movie should end, right? When you, when you, when you say that in like a very fantastical way. Um, I think because I know that Bergman was struggling to like uh, his, to get, to get uh, uh, success uh, yeah. just in general, I think that also played, maybe uh, played a role in this. And this in was definitely, tone, yeah, I think so. Yeah, because yeah. he probably would have been a little bit more cynical. If I he, think so. I think he, he would have himself. I think yeah. he would have went right to the jugular because even he said, you know, beneath the comedy is a very dark story. And it's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have like a, a son in love with his stepmother and you know, that's that that's as dark as things can get, you know? Yeah. And then there's so, all those innuendos there um, yeah. with all the characters. I mean, like how and I don't know. I mean, obviously, Sweden, uh, especially around this time, is way more open than the united states where oh yeah you, you can you certainly see, see that yeah. different types of um like what's what constitute as uh suggestive or or things like that um whereas it's definitely a lot more out in the open or um uh, oh yeah you, you, get, you get those you get those cute uh clues and cues a lot more so um yeah. out in the open and 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 out to dry yeah yeah, no, they 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 obviously didn't have. I don't know what their censor, censorship laws were in Europe or Sweden at that time. I mean, perhaps they didn't have much because I mean, there's you know um, they openly talk about sex or or they openly you know uh, there's that one scene where even Harriet Anderson. Um, I mean, she's not naked, but she like opens up her shirt oh, to show uh, her son the not her son sorry the uh, this the, the 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 son who's becoming a priest where in the States, you know, you couldn't, even at that time, you would have had to have only suggested it. Um, mm -hmm. Everything would have, would have been highly coded. Um, I was really fascinated by the character, uh, the, the son who's becoming a clergyman. I just want to get his name up here. I don't know if you have it handy. Henrik Egerman. Uh, Henrik by, um, Bjorn. Uh, I'm going to say his name wrong. Um <laughs> um they're so hard to say it's hard as b <laughs> like b like vieffelson vieffelstam or something like that let's just Your, say henrik the henrik, <laughs> henrik yeah henrik son of frederick because i can see immediately the hostility he has for his father um and his father you know is mocking what he does for a living and doesn't really help him with his with his problems that you know, he's talking about that he, he can't perform and uh, sexually and even he, he obviously slept with Petra and, you know, he just talks about it. You don't see anything about that. But, you know, later on after that big di dinner scene, when he just loses it on everybody, because even the character starts to to make fun of what he the, the, the soldier starts to make fun of what he does. And when he hangs himself and it's done you know in a funny way because he tries and even the 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 whatever he tied it wasn't even a rope he tied something around his neck that just snatched and um i really wondered what drew drove him to that i mean what i thought was because he didn't feel he measured up to a quote unquote what a man was like his father and you know uh, the, the the soldier character guys with uh, quick with the trigger or something along those lines that he felt he was he was doomed in life. I don't know what you thought about that. Well, maybe I know that um, I, I'm not quoting it directly, but I know that Bergman was at this point really in the gutter. And I think uh, fairly he I think he made a joke or something about the lines of either I'm going to go kill myself or make this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and I honestly think that it that ties into that whole you know, there's those two characters with uh, Frederick and the Count who are a little bit more macho, whereas, you know, Henrik is lacking in those things. And there's that dichotomy. There's that um, there's that balance that he's looking towards where it's like, am I good enough to do these things? But also, should I feel bad enough that I'm lacking these things? Right. And there, therefore, I'm going to, you know, comically try to kill myself, um, uh, obviously. And it, it leads to a really uh, funny, but also uh, charming scene. Right. Yeah, I love that because so, then he just... <laughs> He, he, he runs away with his uh, <laughs> with his stepmother, so to speak. And I really liked her a lot, Ula Jacobson. 
mm-hmm. uh, character. She plays Anne Eagerman. Do, do you think that she got with? Go- I mean, they don't. Ex- I like. I like that they don't explain the backstory of how these people got together because it, it it enriches the experience. Um, I thought you know that she perhaps married Gunnar because of a, a perhaps a father complex of some kind because you don't really know how she feels about him because she very easily runs off with the son, you know? So I don't know what oh, yeah. you thought about that. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, you, something you could see kind of, kind of in the background, it doesn't have to be explained necessarily because I mean, there is that almost father daughter yeah. relationship thing that's going on there. And uh, uh, you know, I mean, she even said it as like, I see him as like a, as like a dad, like a father. Yeah, that's right. figure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with that whole concept, um, you know, seeing that, kind of unfold and it makes it really awkward obviously but um the one thing that i would say that maybe i feel like could have been better is more interactions with henrik and Anne to see that uh build up a little bit more yeah it was quite it was a pretty vague yeah right i mean it was was there just enough but yeah it was quite thin i know what you mean but yeah i mean uh, other than that though I, i feel like um you know, uh, with, with her, I know that she mentioned like, you know, if you were so lonely that one summer and I, I think that's like, that's where the, how they met. Um, that's right. That's right. And, and so with that being said, like, I think he was down in the dumps, maybe from, you know, Desiree. Um, it, maybe that was the case during that particular yeah. thing. Cause he had a marriage beforehand. That's where Henrik came from. Right. Um, right. but right. he was down in the dumps and found her and you know that was like just a stepping stone like a trophy wife or whatever you would say or you know a, a daughter something to pour himself into where it's not he's like kind of half pouring himself into something and not really doing the whole thing yeah like a rebound right. so to speak right you know because why why would you go to your ex lover that you're clearly hung up on to solve your problems with your current wife you know um it's just it you know, it, 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 it makes no, it makes no sense, you know, which I mean, not, not as a criticism, but because his, he, he thinks he's doing the right thing, but it's, it's, it's because he's, he's obviously feeling and attracted to Desiree. And even that scene where he goes to the theater to talk to her and she just will openly get it changed in front of him. She'll let him, you know, watch her in the bath and, um, you know, and he, and he's, he was complimenting her, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a very, not, you know, very sexual way. And I, you could, you could see right there and then that this guy and this woman were totally in love, but he's just totally confused. So she, she, she really has to get him back on track, so to speak, uh, which of course she achieves. And I also really like the scene with her, her mother, you know, they have this idea to throw this party and in, invite everybody. And, you know, there's a great POV shot where from uh, Desiree's point of view, which very much puts us in that perspective where her, her mother, who seemed very comedic at that, at that point, she, she says something about, you know, I, there's nothing I can do to stop any of your human suffering. And I thought, It was really interesting. It was just that showing that sort of parental moment of like, you know, your, your daughter's out in the world and, you know, like she's obviously hung up on someone and you don't know how this is going to go for her. And um, it just has this moment of concern. I thought was quite, was quite relevant, universal uh, people's, you know, concern for their kids when they're out on their own. I don't don't know if that popped out to you at all. It's very brief. Yeah, uh, I, you know, you talking about it uh, expands upon it a little bit. I, did, I didn't think about it at the time, but yeah, it certainly, I, I feel like it's one of those things that, you know, is, is very adult uh, for her to, um, or at least she's got an idea of the fact that like everything is it not uh not a fairy tale it's 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 not a it's not something that uh will will come just because you think it's supposed to be a certain way it's not what it is you you'll never know what the true form of like what love looks like um because everyone's so different and you love what you love and i mean even like with the count and countess like that relationship is like you know to, to me it's like ugh, i don't want yeah. i want them both to be separated right. even though they you know they end up together it's like i don't like that um but it's their own version of how they love each other and like you know it's it's who am i to judge 
um, how they, you know, uh, relate with each other and how they come together. It's kind of the same way where she joked about being thrown out the window. Um, it's like, well, she comes from, you know, maybe that's their version of what love looks like, but everyone else's version is different. I know what you mean, because the, the count and the countess, uh, you know, he's he he's having all these affairs and you wonder, well, why does she love this person and she has that great really great scene which is such a what i would call like a burke Benes scene where it's like an extreme close-up uh where she goes and talks to Anne, and she talks about how she hates her husband and she says it in with such a viciousness like i hate him i hate him i hate him she says it over and over again but then she says she just can't help but love him you know and i think it's because she knows that underneath all of that is is someone who like is a loving guy and in like in order to get him back, she just had to make him jealous, you know, and, and uh, that whole thing that that they they come up with with Desiree uh, obviously works in her favor. So uh, I really like that because I just thought on the one hand, I don't know how well that would hold up today, you know, to see <laughs> to see to see uh, a guy like that still be loved. But. Um, at the same time, I think, you know, people do hurt each other all the time, but are still very much in love and you just, you just, you just move on, you know, and um, I, it, I know what you mean, because it's, it has an ickiness to it, it just doesn't sit quite right, but then at the same time it does. Which, which performances stood out to you the most in this film? Um, I... I quite enjoyed uh, Petra and Frid. I, I think they were like the, you know, the court gestures, of course, of the, the servants. I had a lot of fun with them. I especially loved Petra. Like, I mean, your first introduction to her, she's like swinging her hips. Yeah. And Henrik, yeah. Henrik's like, stop doing that. And then she's like, stop doing what? And then she was really good. I haven't seen her do, you know, when I think of her, I think of like Cries and Whispers and several with right. Monica. But um, she's so funny in this. I mean, it was a really different side to her um and you know you touched on those class class divisions earlier and it, it's true because if you look at her and fritz they're like having a great time they're rolling in the hay and everyone else is like miserable the bourgeois are like stuck in these you know these these uh you know are confused and stuck in delusions and and uh are trying to break out of them and even in the very first scene where Gunnar is at work and as soon as he leaves, you see that the people who work for him are, are making fun of him, <laughs> you know? So I, what does that say about him, you know? And as, as myself, who's, you know, worked entry-level jobs and stuff like that, I mean, often, not always, but you can have perhaps people at the top who are, are not very kind and you do make fun of them. <laughs> yeah. right. or you do and yeah. and you you really saw that with the people who were uh below them uh but yet those are the people who are having the most fun and i think that was bergman sort of um you know siding with with people who are you know not not you know pretentious or highly you know r you know highly highly rich you know he obviously had you know he he was a pretty he, he was he, he was a pretty or, ordinary person in, in some ways, not 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 the depth of his complexity, but he wasn't sort of uh, someone who tried to show off any kind of money or anything like that. I mean, I don't even right. think in Sweden at that at that time uh, they would even really get paid that much. I know as much as he spent in the theater, like and that's kind of is the same to an extent today with even big theater productions like they were just sort of middle class in a lot of ways you know so i i thought that was i don't know if that that, that class was something that popped out to you uh, yeah really popped out to you in this film i'd say so too um but i also think that you know regardless of both uh both servants having like the most fun i guess being you know those those characters outside maybe more on the audience side of things i also feel like they were having their own struggles you know i mean obviously um you, you saw petra uh, you know got get really solemn when you know they after they were having a lot of fun and then frid was like look at the sunset you know yeah. like and you know, he's yeah. talking about the different smiles of, of the summer night of course yeah. um and she I, I think that really like we I, I think it's really really well done from the fact that i feel like a lot of us trick ourselves into the fact that like oh 
like i'm okay i'm having all this fun doing these things uh, and yet we still feel so alone right um because right, right. you know we're even we're, we're pretending right we're pretending to you know be okay whereas maybe everyone who's in the bourgeois look look and like it's like they're so miserable because they they know of like all this this triviality stuff that this like you know kind of you know, pl plaguing themselves um right um, yeah. but it's also with something that you know people who are maybe less fortunate are also dealing with because they have to deal with uh like well, well how do you cope with this like well mm. i cope with it by trying to make fun of it or, or you know try to have fun with it and right. drink or whatever or, or really just live in the moment you know i think frit mm. just kind of like he was really living for that for that season and that in that you know the the weather at that time and of course that plays heavily on this as well because i was just watching a little featurette on the criterion channel and one of the film scholars was saying you know like in sweden um the summers and you know it's even when in canada it's like that here it's like that here often too it's like when it's summer because it's cold a lot we're like mm -hmm. we're people just die for you know heat and of, of course he's using that as a metaphor for passion and love and, and sex. Right. So clearly, um, and you see that to an extent with summer with Monica as well, right. Uh, having those feelings because of the temperature, because of the seasons. And I, I really like that because it's, it's, it's true. I mean, I, I don't think about that as consciously in life as I, as I should, because I, I think there is something to say about seasons and, and um different Passion. temperatures and and yeah yeah and and how it affects our mood and and love life and stuff like that so i i really like that i don't know if i don't know if that popped out to you at all no 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 that i i mean honestly it's i think it, i think you hit the nail on the head with is something that i don't think a lot of us think about necessarily too much um right it's just something that happens naturally with the environment uh yeah. and what we're doing around us and i think summer more people are out you know doing things they're mm -hmm. at lakes beaches rivers whatever um having picnics or something like that they're more social um the the weather's more pleasant you know that can affect our emotions and our behaviors and therefore you know things can happen uh, in a more passionate way maybe towards that not now this is not always the case but in a general so social sense, I, I feel like yeah. that was the case. And so things like these are like, a, like this, like a, a breath of fresh air type of film. Uh, Absolutely. And yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. how it feels. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I couldn't agree more. That's absolutely true. Was there anything else you wanted to mention about this film? Um, no, I just think uh, I will say that, like, you know, the, I, I don't, I, I think I barely mentioned it, but the dialogue. Um, yeah. it's just, I, I think it's just like phenomenal it's and crazy. it's definitely one of those things that, like I said, with repeated viewings, it's definitely sharpened for me and yeah. it's been very interesting to kind of catch all those little things that you don't see beforehand because there's always that, that, that Shakespearean element, right? Yeah, exactly. Those little quips and those little, you know, uh, you know, innuendos that people are throwing at each other. And like, you know, there's that gossip, I suppose, in, in a way, which, um most of us say we don't like it but in film like that's the stuff that like drives a lot of uh you know uh the script or the dialogue in general is is like that and i i think that's what makes it so interesting to a lot of us so um it's a very fun film i would highly recommend it to people who haven't seen it uh, i'm sure a lot of people who are watching this probably have seen it hopefully because we've went all over the place with the plot but. <laughs> yeah i'm all spoilers here as, mm -hmm. I, as I often say um no, no, very, very true. And of course, uh, it is on the Criterion channel if you haven't seen it, or if you have that Bergman box set that came out by the Criterion collection that Nathan has, just came out a few years ago. Uh, that's spectacular. And you can check out Nathan's great channel on YouTube as well. I'll leave the link in the description box uh, below. And where's the, the best place to, for people to find you on social media? I know you're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, um, I would say uh, find me. I do most of my film related things uh, on Twitter um, and Instagram as well. Um, but yeah, uh, finding me on YouTube is good. Um, and uh, that's usually where I post a lot of my uh, film related content. And then, yeah, I would say Twitter and Instagram are, are pretty, pretty safe bet as well. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me on, Robert. No, no, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I always enjoy these Bergman conversations and or anything else we discussed. So please come again uh, to, to do some more. I, I hope you can 
you can, I know you're a busy guy, but I hope we can make it work again sometime soon. <laughs> we definitely will. I mean, I still have a lot of Bergman films to watch. I still haven't finished. Oh, this God. Me too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Well, thanks so much. And for those of you uh, in the audience, uh, there is also an audio version of this podcast. So actually, if you're listening to the audio version uh, right now, uh, it's available on any of the platforms where audio podcasts are, are found. And not everything that is on the YouTube channel is on the audio version. So if you're listening right now, head over to YouTube to see a lot more. And lastly, if this is your first time on the YouTube channel, please consider subscribing by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the Movies logo. You'll see it floating above my head here to your top left. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release a new video or go live. It is absolutely free to subscribe. Thanks so much, everyone, and we'll see you in the next episode.